Um, so I'll be talking about, well, basically, like most of us, about fish migration in altered river systems. Um, basically, my introduction has already been given five times today, so I'll skip through this really fast. <laughs> but basically, what we see is that uh, wildlife in general is seeing pretty massive decline so since the 1970s, which is uh, illustrated by the WWF in their very nice living planet, or well, very nice. I mean, it's a nice report, the findings aren't that nice. Um, but they show that their, uh, well, living planet index is going down pretty drastically. Um, however, fish, uh, freshwater fish and migratory fish are uh, hit especially hard, you know, compared to the 70% overall fish are showing 83, um, for 83% decline for freshwater, and their migratory fish 76. But the bad news doesn't stop there. <laughs> Let's zoom in to the different continents. Um, Europe is facing a decline of about 93% in this living planet index, whereas North America, for example, is scoring pretty good with just a 30% decline. Um, and that kind of raises the question, kind of what's going on in Europe or what makes us so special? Um, well, basically, Europe is heavily fragmented. There's about a million barriers in river in uh, European waterways. Um, a lot of those are like in the Netherlands uh, for water retention, water management kind of things. There's in the Alps for hydropower, stuff like that. And this kind of hydropower that's uh, on the rise, like with the change from fossil fuels to with the green uh, green deal, European green deal to kind of renewable power energy or energy sources, um, we can only expect more hydropower to be uh, developed in the coming years. Um, and basically the, the issue is that these dams block fish migrations and fish need to move between different habitat. They require different habitats for different stages of their life cycle. And by blocking these, we basically limit their um, possibility to, for example, reproduce, which results in this decline we've been seeing. So what's the issue? Well, dams are the issue. Uh, so as I said, they effectively block fish migration simply by being in the way. And then fishways have been developed to mitigate this problem, but as we already heard, um, these fishway, uh, fishways aren't uh, performing as they should. And so this is a study by Henry Hershey, published in 2021. I think that's the one study no one showed so far. <laughs> uh, so basically what he did, he said, okay, the uh, uh, studies by uh, Noonan and Bunce, they've been published back in 2012. We're now, you probably had the idea in 2020 or so, we're about 10 years later, what did we learn so far? So then he saw, okay, basically this kind of attraction efficiency, which is a fancy way of saying, are the fish actually able to find the fishway entrance? How did that kind of evolve? And he pretty much found the same uh, efficiency, so we didn't learn anything yet, which is maybe eh, not that uh, optimistic of a message, but it's a nice paper for those interested. Um, so basically fishways, they don't solve the problem yet. Um, so what do we do? We need to understand how fish kind of navigate these complex uh, environments or these complex eco-hydraulic environments. How, how do they use flow patterns in these uh, river environments where you got flow from a turbine, you got maybe flow from a spillway, and then they need to find that tiny, tiny portion of flow uh, uh, coming from a fishway that's meant to be their guide, guiding light, kind of their, their uh, yeah, guiding light to safety, whereas that's usually overpowered by, well, you know, economical value of the hydropower discharge. And so basically with the uh, acoustic telemetry that Rachel explained in her presentation, we know where fish are going, but we don't know why, kind of what's driving them. And so for example, in this uh, figure, uh, do you see this? No, well, basically you see the, um, uh, this grayling, you see him swimming around the, the river system and you see that there's apparently something around the fishway that attracts him, but we don't know kind of what's going on exactly. Um, and so for this, we turn to kind of behavioral modeling. We turn to, or I turn to hidden Markov modeling. And so basically what, a, what we see is the, the movement path. And what we are interested in is the internal state or behavioral state that Rich already introduced. Um, and that's this is basically the motivation of a fish to show a certain behavior. Now we don't see this directly, 
but we can make uh, assumptions based on the movement, like swimming speed, torque velocity, stuff like that. We can make uh, assumptions about what the behavior is. So is it, rest is it fish resting? Is it searching? Is it in transit? Is it feeding? Is it whatever? Um, and then we can link the environment, so flow velocity, spatial velocity gradients, stuff like that, to kind of uh, the transitions between behavioral behavior. So when, when is the fish going from this transit to searching? Is that, can we link that to certain uh, parameters? Um, and so I applied this, these models to a field study that Rachel also uh, analyzed and a flume study, which I will be talking about uh, in this presentation. But first, I want to kind of go a bit more into the difficulties of acoustic telemetry, which James also touched upon. Acoustic telemetry seems very precise, but it's not. Um, and especially if you zoom in to the extent that we are doing here, um, the positioning error or the measurement error of your position is very, becomes very crucial or it starts to kind of cloud the, the true path of your fish. And so in the top figure where the fish is simply moving along a roughly straight line, that's not an issue. That's okay, it's a bit jumpy, but kind of through your, uh, if you squint a bit, you'll see the pattern. Now the issue becomes, um, more pressing when you look at resident or like stationary fish. So a fish will remain in the in one position. So in the bottom graph or in the bottom figure, that's the black fish. Because of these measurement errors, you will see kind of the position jump around this true position. And those are the red uh, fish in that bottom figure. Basically, if you start looking at swim speed or step length, which we use as a proxy for that, it will become indistinguishable from the straight uh, from the straight movement. And so kind of to get these models to work for the data that we've been working on, we need to turn to some novel or some new parameters explaining uh, movements. So our field study, it's in the south of Germany in a village called Elsheet. It's in the Iller River, which is a tributary of the Danube where we followed barbel and grayling as they approached this fishway. Um, and so, yeah, as I said, we want to see how their kind of behavioral switches uh, from transit to what we call resting slash searching because there's some intricacies in the interpretation but that's another story. Um, basically see how those transitions are affected by their by the flow parameters. Um, now because of the issues I explained in the previous graph instead of swimming speed and turning angles they are impossible to use so we looked at straightness index so basically we took a certain time window and over that time window, we calculated how straight a fish is swimming. Basically, if it's one, it will be on a range from zero to one. If it's one, it's a completely straight line. Zero, it's a perfect circle. So we fitted our models. We, well, we did our tracking, we did our data analysis, we fit our models. What we saw, okay, so the top graph, it's the traditional step length that we, that hidden market models use. And you see that there's quite a big overlap between the two uh, behavioral states. So blue is the resting, slash searching, which for readability I cut off. And then the orange will be transit or the, let's say the migratory behavior. Now, if we look at this straightness index, which is the middle and the bottom graph calculated over two different time windows, we see that these states are actually more distinguishable. And so presumably better to use to define behavior. So these are graphs for barbel. And if we look at grayling, we actually see a similar pattern, which is nice because uh, that means it's translatable across species. Um, now that's a pretty, uh, uh, well, if we, basically if we look at the AIC value, so let's say model performance, we see that uh, the straightness index calculated over a wide time interval, it scores way better than the traditional step length and it also scores better than if you look at shorter time windows, basically because your measurement error will be corrected by a larger, um, will be smoothed out more, basically. So that's the model we continued with. Um, we uh, assigned a behavioral state to every detection we had, and then we looked at the transition matrix. Um, basically, what's underlying these hidden Markov models is a transition matrix of like what's the probability of this fish going from resting to resting, for example, or from resting to transit. So in this hypothetical matrix, that's a 90% chance of a resting fish remaining resting, or switching uh, to transit is then the remaining 10%. Now that's let's say the stationary trend transition model. 
you can link that to uh, flow parameters. So what we found is if you link it to the spatial velocity gradient, you see that as the spatial velocity gradient increases, fish will s start switching from this uh, transit behavior to resting slash searching. Now, um, in the figure I showed before, basically the spatial velocity gradient, as Rich also mentioned, it's mainly occurring around this fishway entrance and the rest of the river, it's pretty much absent because the flow, flow feel is pretty uh, equal. So that would mean that this attraction flow from the fishway is actually triggering a response in the fish, which is a nice uh, finding. We found that it's stronger in barbel than in grayling, which might partly be explained by this individual variation or some other um, uh, variable. Now that's uh, for the field study. Um, I also applied this to a flume study. Now this is looking at downstream, uh, downstream movements of brown trout, where we video tracked brown trout as they move down in a tapering flume. Um, this taper was meant to kind of gradually increase flow velocity and then towards the end there was a straight tube um, kind of mimicking a turbine inlet. And so that's to kind of analyze or make inferences on how fish behave near these turbine inlets and see how they would kind of react to those flow patterns. Um, now, because of the very high flow velocities in this uh, flume, like towards the end, it's uh, up to three meters per second, which appro approaches the sprinting capacity of these fish. We couldn't move, use uh, movement speed or swimming speed directly, so we had to correct for uh, the flow velocities and we had to kind of calculate the swimming effort that these fish used. Uh, so we um, calculated the drag force on this fish body, we calculated the power needed to show a certain acceleration in their effort, and then we standardized it by their sprinting capacity. And then you get some time series like that. Um, so basically in the, in the top figure you see that the flow velocity is increasing as the fish is moving down the flume. And in the bottom figure you see kind of this P norm. Uh, we calculated how it evaluates, it uh, evolves over time. And you see two pretty distinct peaks uh, around seven to seven and a half seconds, which indicates kind of a startle response as they kind of encounter that, that area. And if you kind of color your detections based on this, uh, the behavioral state, you see that that occurs around where the taper transitions into the, uh, into the tube. So let's say around the inlet of the turbine, as we would interpret that. Um, and basically, if you try to link that to the spatial velocity gradients, uh, well, you see if you fit it for all the fish and um, you kind of proportionalize it over the, as, uh, over the tracks as they move down in the flume, you see that most of the, these reactions, starter reactions, occur at this kind of corner area where, coincidentally, the spatial velocity gradient is highest. So again, we did the same as in the field study and we saw, okay, these fish react to this spatial velocity gradient. Um, and still, fish were trying to fight this current in the high, velo high velocity area, in, like in the tube itself. But by then, kind of the startle response has already passed. And so a lot of fish already kind of gave up uh, as they entered that area. Um, and so based on these case studies, I will go to some uh, concluding remarks. So at least in our studies, fish seem to react to these spatial gradients rather than just the flow velocity itself. Um, which seems like an open door because fish need to be able to sense kind of the changes in their environments rather than just the bulk flow. Um, so in general, attraction flows and kind of these behavioral, uh, behavioral guidance screens need to be uh, focused on this gradients rather than just bulk flow velocity. Um, however, most of these studies, including my own, are focused on rheophilic species, so which are kind of evolved to react to this, uh, well, high flowing areas. Um, and like Eurotopic or liminophilic species are getting less uh, attention. And so it would be nice to see more studies on those species. Um, then using the models that are, have been developed for kind of these coarser spatial temporal skills, we can use them for very fine scale data. Like as Rachel mentioned, in our field study, we have got a position every second um, in our video tracking, we have a 60 frame per second tracking. Hidden markers have been developed for daily uh, positionings. So kind of zooming in into this incredibly fine scale spatial temporal uh, resolution seems to work, which is uh, nice and 
proves that actually the behavioral modeling is pretty robust. And then another open door, probably understanding how fish behave in response to their environment is crucial in fish way design. Um, however, uh, many studies only focus on a few species and it would be nice to see a more community-based approach. And findings, again, we, I am guilty of this, findings are difficult to contextualize if it's really zoomed in on a very fine scale. And it would be nice to kind of zoom out again and combine it with, uh, for example, a what, what we call a one-dimensional tracking study where you just look at uh, just a longitudinal migration of the fish. So where in the river uh, is the fish, like which kilometer stretch, and then zoom in on some specific areas to understand what's going on in detail. Um, and with that, I want to thank you for listening. If there's questions, now's your time.